Hello everyone. In this video we are going to talk about regression. Regression is basically a um, supervised learning method in general that can predict the value of the dependent variable for a um, specific new data, we call it the test data, if you have already created a model based on a lot of training data where your data includes the uh, data points which are vectors with so many feature values and a label or a tag or a correct output for them, correct? So let's say y is a function of x or uh, z is a function of x and y. So you have one dependent variable and so many independent variables and you provided pairs of these dependent and independent, uh, independent variables and dependent variable to a model, to a function that you think is the underlying function. And this underlying function has some parameters that you have to find such that the underlying function kind of passes through the data the best way it can. We call it the best fit. So, uh, there are several different algorithms in the real literature, a bunch of them actually, that you can use. The simplest and, yes, my, one of the most effective ones is called linear regression. So we call let me talk about linear regression first, and then there are some uh, more sophisticated versions of that ridge regression, lasso, and elastic net. So what is linear regression? Linear regression is when uh, when you have a function, you assume a function between your dependent variable and the independent variables. Your model also, as I said, includes some parameters, some weights, some uh, unknown values, like, for example, the coefficients of a polynomial. And when would you call it linear? When the relation, when the relation that you form between y, x, and w, your independent, dependent, and the parameters, can be written into a linear relation like you see here. That a coefficient matrix times the unknown vector is equal to a known right-hand side. So the coefficient matrix is basically a bunch of known values. The right-hand side is a bunch of known values, and they are functions of the independent and dependent uh, variables so they are just some numerical data and this unknown w you can easily from here find it by inverting the matrix a and multiplying it by the right hand side b so if the relation is linear in terms of what in terms of the unknown vectors in, ter in terms of the unknown parameters the unknown you might call predictors the coefficients then we call it a linear model. Otherwise, it's a nonlinear model in terms of the parameters, and you need what we call nonlinear regression, which is going to be a future video. So, for example, let's say here uh, you want to what? You want to fit a line to a bunch of observations. So, what you have is you have a bunch of data points here are shown with these blue circles. And your assumption is that the underlying function which describes the relation between y and x is a line of form y equal ax plus b. Clearly, this model that you assume has two unknown coefficients, a and b. Together, they form this vector w. Okay? And x and y are the x and y of the six given points. Right? So now... What would you do? Can I write this relation as a linear relation? Absolutely. Why? Because, for example, if I go back here, if this y is ax plus b, then y1 is like ax1 plus b1, y2 is 
a x2 plus b and all the way to let's say y n which is a x n plus b now can i write all of this into a linear format in terms of the unknown vector and here your unknown vector is simply what a and b so this is your unknown vector w can I write it that way? Sure. So I can write it as what? I can write it as a, a matrix like this times the unknown vector is equal to some right hand side. So this is a 2 by 1, this is an n by 2, and this is going to be an n by 1. And what are these? Well, so the coefficients of a and b are going to go for the first equation. They're going to go to the first row. So how many a's and how many b's are seen in the first equation? A times, uh, or sorry, x1 times a and 1 times b. So it's going to be x1, a, and 1, b. The same thing, x2, a in the second equation and 1, b all the way to x n a and 1 b and this is equal to y 1 y 2 all the way to what y n so clearly you see that i could have uh i i could write this equation into a matrix format this is that a of x that i told you this is your w unknown and this is your right hand side b which is a function of y right so now can i invert a and multiply by b to get w not necessarily if n is equal to 2 yes this is a 2 by 2 matrix i can do it as long as x1 and x2 are not the same which shouldn't be then otherwise you have two points on the top of each other then yes it's an invert of a two by two but when n is bigger than two like this case right you have six points in this case in the case of this figure right here n is six you have six data points this guy is going to be a six by two so can you invert a six by two no but uh there is a solution for that as i can show you and here your w is going to be what we call the pseudo inverse of a a plus times b where the pseudo inverse is like uh, we call it the left pseudo inverse and it's something that when you multiply by a the result is i right so it is like this This guy here is your left pseudo inverse. Okay, so which is a generalization of inverse. Still, you can find it. Now, is that the only linear regression? No. Now, you might say, what if this was a higher order polynomial? It wasn't a line. Can I still qualify it as a um, linear regression? Absolutely. So, what's going to happen there? For instance, assume that the function we want to pass through these points is not a line, it is a quadratic. Then what's going to happen? So your quadratic is now going to be something like y equals a times x squared plus b times x plus c. So now the relations are going to be something like this. Right? Can I still write it as the um, linear format as I had? Absolutely. What is that going to be? So now it is going to be something like this. Here, now you have three coefficients. So it's going to be A, B, and C. And here, what you have is an extra, uh, an extra column here to the left where it is going to be like x1 squared and x2 squared all the way to 
xn squared. So now this is an n by 3. This is a 3 by 1. This is an n by 1. But still, you see, in terms of these unknown coefficients, it is a linear relation. So any polynomial, any polynomial of any power between y and x, let's say, can always be written in a linear format in terms of its unknown coefficients. So although the relation between y and x is not linear, but the relation in terms of the parameters are linear. Okay, and is that the only function, polynomial, that qualifies for linear regression? No. There are other functions for which, if you do some manipulation on the data, you can still perform the linear operation on them. And you might say, like what? For example, let's say y is equal to a times uh, exponential b times x. Clearly, again, the relation by no means is what? Is um, a linear relation between y and x. But can I say this is a linear relation? Yes. What I need to do is now I take a natural log from both sides. So it's going to become natural log y is what? This is going to be natural log of two terms multiplied, and you know it's going to be natural log of first one plus natural log of second one. And uh, this is going to stay a natural log of A, and this one, natural log of EBX, is simply going to be B times X. So now if you look at this, this is very similar to the relation of a line. If you call this guy Z, and if you call this new one maybe some A prime, then your relation is like this. Z equals, or maybe call it C, you don't have to call it A prime, C, it's like C plus BX. You see? Clearly it's a polynomial again. But instead of using y on the right hand side you have natural log of y and the c that you will get is going to be natural log of a so what you need to form here is if you have again those data it's going to be like um, x1 and 1 x2 and 1 all the way to xn and 1 times and this is going to be B and C, and here is going to be natural log of Y1, natural log of Y2, all the way to natural log of Yn. Okay, and now, when you find B and C here, through that pseudo-inverse I told you, this B is directly the B that you have in your model, but the C that you find is natural log of A. So from here, your A is going to be what? Exponential of C. So once you find C, you plug it up here. That gives you A. Once you have A and B, you can have your function. Okay? So as long as with any mathematical manipulation, you can convert the relation between independent and dependent variables to a linear format in terms of the parameters, not between x and y, in terms of the parameters that qualifies for linear regression. Now, how would you solve for those, um, uh, what we call uh, the coefficients? Now, I, I showed you some uh, general formula, right? The pseudo inverse. But what is the uh, math behind it? It's a simple thing which we call list squares, okay? So what is that? Here we say, well, if I have more data points than the number of unknowns, then it is impossible that you can pass your function through all of the points, correct? Because you have when you write these, these guys, when you write them, you have a lot more equations than unknowns. For example, even here, if you use a cubic polynomial, you only have three coefficients, 
But guess what? You have six equations because this goes from y1 to y6. And it's impossible to get exact y's for all of the points because your system is underdetermined. So inevitably, at any x point, you might have what? Some deviation. In other words, the y that this underlying function that you assumed is going to give you is going to be different than the actual y that you are using for training. Okay? So the y that you get from this function, you call it y hat, the estimate for y. And this y hat, as I said, is different from the actual y, okay? There is some difference between them because you can never make them to be equal. Your system is underdetermined. So what is the goal here? The goal is the difference between actual y and the estimated y, which in this picture, you can see with these vertical lines. The actual y is at the blue point. The uh, predicted y is uh, the same point, but projected on the line. Right? So this is y6. This guy is y6 hat. This is y5. This is y5 hat, and so on. The goal is to minimize these vertical deviations. We can minimize these vertical deviations. That's the best set of parameters that you can choose for your what? For your um, uh, line. Because guess what? I have these six points. You might say, well, this black line is the best line to pass through them. I say, no, I think this red line is the best line to pass through them. Somebody else might say, no, I think, for example, this orange line is the best line to pass through them. So among these different lines, which correspond to different values for A and B, which one would you choose? As I said, the best one is the one that have minimal of these vertical distances. Now you might say, can I simply say the one is the best that has minimum sum of them? Because uh, you have to add all of this together, right, to make a cost function, right, something to optimize, something to minimize. Can I simply add those and say the best line is the one that minimizes some of all of these deviations? The answer is no. Why? Because some of these deviations are positive, some of them are negative. If your uh, goal is to reduce y minus y hat, so here, your y is above y hat, so this entity is positive. Here, your y is below y hat, so it is negative. Okay, negative, positive, negative, positive. And when you add these negatives and positives, even if they are very big, they still might cancel each other. And so, if you simply add this together, the total summation might be a small number, although these individual deviations are very large. But since they are positive, negative, they cancel each other. So that's not a good idea to simply add them together. But it's a good idea if you square them first, so they are all positive, add them together, and now you try to minimize what we call sum of squared error. Because each term here is an error term. And you're summing up the squares of these errors. SSE, which you can see over here. Sum of the square error, where error, as I said, is defined as the difference between your actual y and the estimated y. And you try to minimize this. Now, clearly, this cost function is a function of your unknown parameters. So if I want the best set of parameters, I need to set the derivative of cost function with respect to what? Each and every one of these parameters to zero. This is a gradient, right? I need to set this equal to zero. That gives me enough equations to solve for what? A and B or any parameters that I have in my system. So for example, if I go with the fitting of the line, and that's why we call it list squares, right? We are, we, we are looking for a function which gives us the minimum of some squared errors, so we call it the list squares. 
curve fitting, right? This is another term that you hear a lot. So now if I go uh, down again, if the goal is to fit a line, the estimated y is a linear function, and this is actual data, this is estimated data, I subtract, square each individual term, add them together, and then my cost function is one half of that. Now you might say, what is this one half? This one half is, since later when you take a derivative, that one half with this power two that you have would cancel out. Okay, but in general, adding or not adding that one half is not going to change anything. The final solution is going to be the same, with or without it. So here, if I take partial derivative of cost function with respect to A, what's going to happen? This power 2, as I said, with one half would cancel each other. The derivative of this whole term with respect to X is clearly what? A negative Xi which comes out, which you can see it here, and then the linear term. That is equal to zero if you take derivative with respect to b. The coefficient behind b is negative one, so that negative one comes out times the linear term equals zero. So now you have what? You have two equations. And if you rearrange these two equations in terms of what? a and b here, what does it look like? So it is going to be a matrix times A and B is equal to some right hand side. And what are they? So if you look here, and uh, if you cancel this negative terms with zero because you don't need it really. So this is like x i y i term minus x times x i square term, then minus b times x. So if you take these two negative terms to the right hand side, the coefficients of a are x squared, the coefficients of b are x, but there is a summation here. So this one is going to be summation of xi squared. This is going to be summation of xi. And if you look here, the coefficients of a are just, again, summation of xi. And the coefficients of b are 1, but you have n of them. So this simply is going to be n, or summation of 1s n times. Okay, and this is equal to... Now, on the right-hand side, you have x, y, and y. So this is going to be summation of x, i, y, i. And this is going to be summation of y, i. And again, what? You have a known matrix. You have a known right-hand side. You have an unknown uh, vector. And by inverting, in this case, because it's 2 by 2, you can easily get what? You can easily get the solution. And now you might say, well, what happens if the order of the polynomial is higher? So if the order of the polynomial is order m, so let's say y equals c1 plus c2x plus all the way to c to the uh, cm plus 1 times x to the m, where m, the order of the polynomial, or the number of coefficients, m plus 1 in general, is quite smaller than the number of data points. If they are equal, then uh, that's what we call the overfitting. Okay, so um, the uh, goal here is to pass the best fit function, not really to pass it through each and every one of the points. And we'll get back to it, but uh, we really need to avoid overfitting. So in this case, you will have a coefficient matrix, an unknown vector, and a right-hand side, where here, this is like m plus 1. This is m plus 1 course by 1 
and this guy is m plus 1 by m plus 1. So here goes like C1, C2, all the way to Cm. And the coefficients are like n here, the number of data points. Then you get summation of xi and summation of xi squared. And these powers uh, will go up all the way to summation of xi to the m. So this is power 0, this is power m, and that means m plus 1 columns. Here, uh, they go up by 1 in power of x. So if this was summation of xi to the power 0, here you start with xi to the power 1. This one, that was x, becomes xi squared. This one becomes xi cubed. And you go all the way up to xi to the m plus 1. And you go down all the way. Here you start with summation of xi to the m. Summation of xi to the m plus 1, m plus 2, all the way to 2m. And here you have summation of yi, summation of xi, yi and all the way to summation of xi to the m, right? Because, again, this is power 0, goes all the way to power m times yi. Okay, so this is for a polynomial of order m. Again, m or m plus 1 should be quite less than n if you don't want to go with overfitting. So this is linear regression. Now, what are some of the good and bad things about linear regression? Well, it is very good even compared to some of the more sophisticated versions that uh, when there is not a huge amount of observation, so n here is not very, very big, still can do a decent job and uh, it can predict the output, does the regression job with quite uh, reasonable or good accuracy. What is the problem? One of the problems is outliers. If there are outliers in the data, those outliers can bump up one of these error terms to some huge value, and so they literally change your right-hand side here in this uh, overall equation. They change the right-hand side, therefore they change the coefficients, and they significantly change the underlying function that you're estimating. So you should either uh, do an outlier analysis and get rid of the outliers before you do this uh, simple uh, regression, or uh, you should be prepared to get um, some uh, significant amount of error. The other problem they have is the way that they are set, there is no penalty for using more weights. So the big question that we have is, what is this M? We said this M should be less than N, but how far? If I have a bunch of data points, Right? What is the order of the polynomial, let's say, that I want to pass? When is it that I decide something is good? And that's where uh, I mentioned it in one of my first videos on machine learning, that you divide your number of data points into training, testing, and validation, and you try to come up with a plot of the uh, sum of uh, some squared error terms for what? For the validation and for the uh, training. And although for your training set, the sum squared error versus M can always go down. So ideally, it can even go to zero when M equals N minus one, right? 
but for your validation set, which are not used in the training, so you never use them to calculate any of the summation terms, it's a portion of your data. If you look at some squared error, using the function that you fit, they look like this. And so where the minimum happening, that you can say this is like my optimum what? This is like my optimum value for M. So you have to do some extra analysis to choose a value for M so that you don't do what we call underfitting or you don't do what? Overfitting, correct? So it is important that you do some side analysis to decide the order. Otherwise, this method will not produce reasonable results. Okay, now is there any way that we can decide on the number of these parameters uh, by adding something to this cost function? Right now, the cost function is only the error terms. Is there something we can do? Exactly. That's how we do the ridge regression and the lasso and elastinet. As you'll see, we add some extra terms to our cost function and try to force our uh, weights to be small or some of them potentially to even be zero, which literally means when some of those ABCs are zero, it means the order of the polynomial can go down. Or the, or the number of parameters in general, because not every time you are dealing with the polynomial. Okay, so you need to do some side analysis. There is no penalty for more weights or, in general, larger weights. It doesn't need to necessarily be more weights. It could also be what? Larger weights. Let me add that here. Or coefficients. So you can easily get entangled with over or under fitting. Okay. But this is the overall idea of what? Uh, linear regression. So now Ridge and Lasso try to improve on the linear by adding what? Some extra term as the penalty for the weights. So what does Ridge regression do? Let's take a look. Ridge regression says, hey, not only I want the error to be minimized, I also want the norm of the vector of unknowns, the norm 2, the Euclidean norm, square of it, to also be as small as possible. So they, in the Ridge method, you combine cost function 1, which is error, and cost function 2, which is norm squared of the vector of unknowns, you combine them using a what? Using a Lagrangian multiplier. You combine them together and you try to minimize this function. So now not only the fitted uh, function will try to minimize the error, it is trying to use as small as possible the values for those coefficients. Let's say for the line, it is trying to use a smaller a and b as much as possible. Okay. Now, how much would the second term push to reduce the size of A and B, let's say, for the line or the vector of W? It depends on this parameter lambda. If this lambda is zero, you definitely get back what? Your original uh, uh, linear regression, correct? If this lambda is bigger, then the importance of the second term is uh, higher, and so you will get what? You will definitely get smaller and smaller uh, values for the weights. Okay? Now, pay attention that the ridge regression forces the weights to be smaller, but not necessarily what? Zero. So, it does not change the number of required parameters it just say whatever you choose i'm okay with it as long as you keep them small and that's not necessarily a good thing because even with the smaller weights if you use too many of them you can still have what some overfitting 
So although it brings down the weight, the value of those weights, which reduces the variance on the test data, okay, at the cost of a larger bias, but again, it does not force any of those Ws to necessarily go to what? Zero. It just tries to keep them small. So what? So even if the polynomial, let's say for this example, that you are trying to fit to this is a higher order polynomial and you get a test data not using the training set, these oscillations that you will get here, they are not as significant because the weights are small, so this peak is going to be now replaced, for example, with something like this. Okay, because the weights are smaller. So it tries to bring down, as we said, the variance on the test data. Now, of course, it does a little bit, uh, ex it does produce a little bit extra bias or extra error in the what? The average of the data compared to average of the predicted data, which we call bias. This method of read regression is also called L2 regularization. And I mentioned in one of my first video the term regularization. And I even showed you this transfer, this uh, cost function. But over there, I did not necessarily name it read regression, but uh, I just call it regularization. As long as it's with the two norm, right, magnitude squared, then I call it L2 regularization, or in literature, we call it what? Ridge regression. Now, one question that you might have is, why? how would you decide on this lambda now? What value of lambda is good? So for that, you have to do something similar to your what? To your uh, training validation and test and break down your data and keep a portion of it for validation. And on the validation, you test different values of lambda and see which lambda will produce the smallest mean squared error or sum squared error. So if you really want to do a good job and get the best that you can get on J, you have to decide on the optimum value of lambda. And so you have to do some extra site training, as I said, with validation set to define the best lambda. If you don't, compared to the uh, linear regression that does not use the second term, does not use this lambda w squared term, you will definitely have what? A smaller weights, but doesn't mean that it can also produce a smaller sum squared error, not necessarily unless, again, you find the best value of what? Lambda. Now, graphically, what does it do? If I show you here the result, so here your uh, blue line is the linear regression, and your green is the ridge. And what's the difference? Uh, if you can see, your blue line kind of passes through the middle of the data a little bit better than the black line. But if you look here, clearly the slope of the black line is smaller than slope of the blue line. And slope means this parameter A. So definitely A of the ridge regression is less than a that you have for linear regression. And that is because this term is into effect. Good. What about their biases? As I said, typically in this case, the bias term B is a little bit bigger, actually, on the other hand. So you might say, now what? But the square, when you square them and add them together, this A of ridge regression squared plus B of it squared, this guy is going to be what? Smaller than the same thing that you do for the linear regression. So 
as you try to minimize this guy. Okay, so it might give you a little bit bigger uh, Y intercept, which is B, but it definitely gives you a smaller slope. And that you can see comparing the black line versus the blue line. Or sorry, the green, uh, the green line versus the, um, uh, I don't know why, <laughs> for some reason I thought that the black is the ridge is the green one that is the ridge so the slope of the green is definitely less than the slope of the blue okay lasso is always between we'll see next lasso is always between linear and ridge okay somewhere in between so black is lasso uh so what is lasso Lasso, which stands for Least Absolute Shrinkage and Selection Operator, it is another regression. And um, what's the difference that it has with respect to ridge? Here you have a linear term, a, a norm, but not to the power 2 of the vector of unknowns added to the sum squared error. What's good and what's bad about it? The bad thing is, if I go back again to my example of fitting a line, this function here is not going to be a squared plus b squared. It's going to be square root of that, correct? Right? Like this. And when you take derivatives of your cost function with respect to a and b and set it to zero, the resulting equations are not going to be linear anymore. Look here. If I do that in ridge, my norm squared is a squared plus b squared. When I take partial derivative of j with respect to a and b and set them equal to zero, the extra term that are introduced in my equations are 2a lambda and what? 2b lambda. Okay, so if I want to write this whole set as matrix format, I can absolutely do that again, right? What do I have for A? I have summation of xi squared plus 2 lambda summation of xi for B. Here, I will have summation of xi, and here I will have n plus 2 lambda. This whole thing times a and b is equal to summation of yi and summation uh, or summation of xi, yi, and yi. So clearly, you see, I still can write my um, problem into a matrix format and I invert the left-hand side, multiply by right-hand side. So I can easily solve for A and B, right? Because here, the derivatives of this square term will be linear terms. But when you do it with the single power, power 1, this becomes a square root, and the derivative of a square root will remain a nonlinear term. So now, can I write this set of equations in matrix format? Not anymore. So what do I do? This time, I have to solve two equations, but these equations are what? Nonlinear. And they are coupled. So I have to solve two nonlinear equations coupled at the same time. One of them, you can call it F1 of A and B, which is this function. The other one is F2 of A and B, which is this function. And the, go, the way to go about it is a gradient descent algorithm or Newton Raphson, which is definitely the gradient descent algorithm, okay, or any nonlinear solver. And I'll show you, actually, in my code, in my demo code, 
I have used Newton Raphson and I could solve for what? For the solution A and B. So solution of the lasso regression uh, is not as uh, easy as the ridge or the linear. You definitely used to use nonlinear. You have to use nonlinear solvers. So why should we go through this painful process of nonlinear? Because when there are a lot of them, it's going to be a lot harder. And uh, what's the advantage? The advantage is this. <clears throat> First of all, it forces some of the weights to go to zero. Not just make those weights what? Get smaller. Actually, it forces some of them to be zero because this is a linear term. So definitely, this term can go to zero for one single parameter too. So that's why we call this method a selection operator. What does selection mean? If out of 10 W's that I have, this method forces four of them to go to zero, right? So let's say you start with 10 W, and this method forces them, four of those WIs, to be zero. So now you practically have what? You have six WIs left. So instead of a system with order 10, now you have a system with order 6, right? And this is what? This is a model selection. It's equivalent to saying instead of a 10th order or 9th order polynomial, now I'm using a 5th order polynomial. So this is a selection operator. It selects the model or the order of the model for you by forcing some of the way to go to zero. It does not just force them to be smaller, some of them to be zero. That's the big advantage of lasso. Good. And the other term that you might hear in machine learning, they say this method induces sparsity. So when in a matrix or a vector, you have a bunch of zeros, we call that the sparse matrix or vector. So it makes this W vector that you initially chosen to be end up with a bunch of zeros, so it makes it sparse. As I said, you have to solve it numerically because they are nonlinear equations. And one of the other things it has is this. If the number of parameters you choose, the size of this W vector, is greater than the number of data points, then lasso will force out of those m parameters to only n of them be non-zero. The rest of them will be zero. Now, this typically doesn't happen too often. This is where what? Let's say here in this picture, I have only 10 data points, but the number of w that I choose, they are like i goes from, for example, 1 to 2any while n, the number of data points, is simply 10. Again, it doesn't typically happen. That's a clear case of overfitting, right? Most of the time, the number of parameters you choose is way lower than the number of data points or observations. But if you go ahead and do the other way around, you try to really overfit the model, lasso forcibly makes out of this 20 to only 10 of them be non-zero, the other, as many as you want, depending on how much you choose M, it forces all of them to be zero. So you will never ever get more than N non-zero Ws ever. Okay? If N is less than M, if N is bigger than M, and you don't go with so many parameters, it still can make the size of W to be what? Way less than your original M that you selected. Now, since the power of W is 1, not 2, it does not penalize the magnitudes as much as the ridge does. So if you compare that side by side with ridge, you clearly see that the slope here in the lasso is what? is definitely, as you can see, bigger than the slope of the ridge, but still a little bit, what, smaller than the linear, right? The regression, because there is some penalty, but not as harsh as penalty as 
you have. So the slope of ridge is always the smallest, right? Slope of the ridge is always, ridge regression is always less than what? If you look at it in terms of polynomial, less than the slope of the lasso, and it is less than the slope of your linear regression. Now, the smaller the slope, it means the smaller the variance on a test data or a set of test data. So if I talk about variance on the test data, definitely linear regression has bigger variance on the test data. Let me uh, write it as sigma squared. So sigma squared on the test data for the linear regression is going to be bigger than a similar thing that you calculate for lasso. And it is going to be bigger than the similar thing that you calculate for the ridge. Right? So, uh, before me going to the last one, elastic net, let me show you the demo code that I wrote. So here I have uh, 15 data points. The underlying function I use is really a line, 3x plus 7. And I show my data with red circles. Here, I'm using the linear regression. You see I'm forming the matrix A and B and inverting it and plotting the line of linear regression. For ridge, I have to add the lambda terms, as I showed you. And that gives me the uh, A and B for the um, ridge. And then I can form my um, Y hat, the estimate. I use a lambda of 10 here. And then for the same lambda, I use the lasso. And for lasso, I definitely have to use a loop of newton raphson to get what? To get to the final answer. Clearly, my functions are two nonlinear functions. So I use newton raphson to solve it. And then I plot the lasso. And let's see, all of them next to each other. So here we go. Raw data are the circles. Your linear regression is the blue line. Green is the lasso. And black is the ridge. Clearly, you see the slope of the ridge is the smallest. The slope of the linear is the biggest. In this case, lasso is quite close to your um, linear. Still smaller. If you zoom in, you clearly see that the lasso produces a smaller slope compared to the linear but it is quite closer to the linear than to the ridge, okay? And uh, here, if I just show you what? If I just show you the um, effect of lambda, so let me create two plots for you side by side. So this is one plot, okay? Where lambda here is 10. Now I'm going to create another uh, plot for you. This time I bump up lambda to 50. Okay, so you see when lambda gets bigger, it is going to affect the weights definitely uh, more and makes them smaller. So uh, let me run again. There we go. So now You can put them side by side. You clearly see the slope of the ridge dropped significantly compared to when lambda was 10. Here, lambda is 50. Okay, and now you see more gap between linear and lasso because lambda is bigger, right? But you definitely see it is affecting the ridge a lot more and the slope of the ridge drops big time, okay? Because we are using a bigger lambda. 
So you can play with this code. I allow you to download the code at and give you a link at the bottom of the video description. So uh, you can learn about the effect of each one. And you might say, well, lasso has some good things. It forces something to go to zero. Ridge is amazing too in terms of making them small, but they have their drawbacks, right? Especially Ridge, correct? That doesn't really bring down some of the weights to zero. Is there any way that I can combine these two together? And the answer is for sure. The combination of these two methods is called elastic net. An elastic net uses both a linear penalty term and a quadratic penalty term. And here you have to use two Lagrangian multipliers. So one of them is like lambda 1, the other one is lambda 2. Or they can write lambda 1 and lambda 2, one of them as like a parameter alpha, the other one as lambda times 1 minus alpha over 2. It doesn't matter. And here, you, your job of uh, deciding on the best set of lambda 1 and lambda 2 is more complicated. Because now, not only in, in the previous cases, you only had to decide what is the best lambda. This time, you have to decide what is the best set of lambda 1 and lambda 2. So you have to do an optimization, right? A multivariable optimization first before even you can start your... Uh, value of j so uh, definitely it comes again with some advantage and some disadvantage that's the word of optimization okay welcome to the word of optimization you make something better something else goes worse and it's always a trade-off you have to decide what is it that you want to do which one is more important to you in this case computation versus basically the accuracy of the prediction so hopefully the video was useful to you and i will see you in my next lecture thank you